Welcome back for another episode of Vintage Egyptologist. Today, we're going to be talking about scents, perfumes, and incense in ancient Egypt. And our sponsor today is none other than Penhaligans, a company with a storied history going back to 1870 and the holder of two royal warrants, the first in 1903. The reason why I want to begin with the concept of royal warrants is because of King Hatshepsut, who not only used incense as a way to legitimize her kingship, but also dispatched an expedition to Punt to fetch incense, frankincense, and myrrh, and commemorated that as one of the signature achievements of her reign. King Hatshepsut ruled between 1473 and 1458 BCE. She was the daughter of a king, Tutmos I, and a wife of another king, Tutmos II. Upon the death of Tutmos II, Hatshepsut essentially takes over as regent, ruling while Tutmos III is a child. However, seven years into this arrangement, she actually declares herself king, very possibly because she had a very important ritual role, the god's wife of Amun, and also could trace back her lineage to both the kings and the queens of the late 17th dynasty. Hatshepsut uses some interesting means to legitimize her kingship, including a fascinating cycle of reliefs at her temple on the west bank of Thebes, now called Dar al-Bahri. We call these scenes the divine birth cycle. These images and texts claim that the god Amun is actually Hatshepsut's father. And this goes back to the very beginnings of Egyptian kingship, where the king was believed to be the earthly incarnation. At first, the god Horus, and soon after, the sun god Ra. By the time of the Middle Kingdom, the god Amun of Thebes, who then becomes the imperial god of the New Kingdom, is closely associated with kingship. But Hatshepsut's reign is the first time that we have these images preserved in this way with these hieroglyphic annotations. So how does Amun, engendering the future king Hatshepsut, relate to perfume? In this scene, we see Amun on the left. His crown is mostly damaged, but we know from many, many other examples of Amun that he would have been wearing a crown with two tall ostrich plumes. And on the right, we see Queen Ahmoza, who is Hatshepsut's mother. Ahmoza and Amun's legs are crossed, and he is giving the sign of life both to her nostrils and into her palm. These are subtle ways in which the Egyptians express intimacy. The hieroglyphic text is a bit more explicit. Quote, Words spoken by Amun-Ra, lord of the thrones of the two lands, foremost of his private apartment. After he made his transformation into the majesty of this her husband, Tutmos, given life. So that is how Amun-Re gains entry into the queen's bedroom. He transforms into the king, into Tutmos the first. The hieroglyphic text then continues. He, Amun, found her, the queen, as she was resting in the interior of the palace. She awakened because of the divine aroma, and she smiled before his majesty. So what gives the god away, what indicates to the queen that it is Amun, and not her husband Tutmos I, is how he smells. After the actual divine conception occurs, we read how, quote, 
Love of him coursed through all of her limbs, and the palace was inundated with divine aroma. Every one of his scents was from Punt. And this toponym, Punt, is fascinating because that is the origin of so many of the materials that the ancient Egyptians used to create their own scents. It is difficult to pinpoint exactly the ancient location of Punt. However, we know from Hatshepsut's reliefs that she dispatched a maritime expedition. She had ships built, dismantled, taken across the eastern desert, probably on the Wadi Hamamat Road, reassembled, and launched south along the Red Sea. And we have fabulous depictions of the sorts of fish that the sailors encountered. When the Egyptian expedition brought back from Put onto you trees, trees that would produce the incense that would be burnt upon the altars of temples throughout Egypt. We know that by doing this, Hatshepsut was fulfilling the promises that she made to her divine father, Amun. The ancient Egyptians had several different words for incense. The main word is sinetr, which literally means to make divine. So the root natur, meaning God, or naturi, divine, with a causative S prefix, thus to make divine. Another word for incense the Egyptians use is kapet, and that root refers to smoke or burning. And it's really interesting that the ancient Egyptian word kapet thus has the same etymology of our word perfume, which goes back to Latin meaning from smoke, because the easiest way to release a scent in antiquity was through burning. In addition to temple ritual, burning incense for the gods, the ancient Egyptians also used scents during celebrations. And this is where we get that concept of the perfume-infused wax cones that people would place on top of their wigs during giant festival celebrations. This Ramazan tomb painting is a brilliant example of how ancient Egyptian art is full of scents. We can see the scented wax cones that both the man and his wife are wearing. But we also see floral collars beneath their chairs. And another great indication of scent are the lotus blossoms also decorating the women's wigs. So when we see art like this, it's not just an indication of the visual richness of a festival celebration or here a funerary banquet, but the images themselves are redolent with the sweet smells of the ancient Nile Valley. When the ancient Egyptians made perfumes, what they were actually creating were scented ungents and oils. Because at that point in antiquity, distillation had not been invented, meaning that you could not have alcohol-based perfumes as we have today and as certainly existed by the Middle Ages. But there's even an Egyptian connection here because it appears that the process of distillation, which required a certain type of glassware, was actually created by a female alchemist who lived in Alexandria in the first couple of centuries CE. Maria of Alexandria, the alchemist, thus set the stage for later developments of distillation and perfumes that we can enjoy today, such as the remarkable historical and trade routes collections at Penhaligans. In future episodes, we're going to dive deeper into the ancient Egyptian origins of alchemy, going beyond the work of Maria of Alexandria and Zosimos of Panopolis into how metallurgists and miners of the pharaonic era set the intellectual stage 
for the deep alchemical reflections that we see in later authors.